Hello, I hope you guys are having a good day. Well, Grandma wants to read you a story from the book, The Book of Virtues for Young People. And it is an adaptation of a classic Greek myth story called The Minotaur. And just as a little bit of background, this is about the virtue of courage. And it is a story of courage and compassion. There are two heroes in the story. The first is Theseus, who goes into the maze to save his countrymen. And the second is Ariadne, who searches her heart and realizes she must defy her own father to save Theseus and the others. We can be sure that both Theseus and Ariadne were afraid of the danger they faced, but they did the right thing anyway. It is not the absence of fear that defines courage, but doing the right thing despite one's fears. And so here is the story. It begins in Athens, one of the greatest and most noble cities in ancient Greece. At the time it takes place, however, Athens was only a little town perched on top of a cliff, rising out of a plain two or three miles from the sea. King Aegeus, who ruled Athens in those days, had just welcomed home a son he had not seen since the child's birth, a youth named Theseus. He was destined to become one of Greece's greatest heroes. Remember, this is a Greek mythology story. Aegeus was overcome at overjoyed, excuse me, at having his son home at last. But Theseus could not help but notice moments when the king seemed distracted and sad. Gradually, Theseus began to sense the same melancholy among the people of Athens. Mothers were silent, fathers shook their heads, and young people watched the sea all day as if they expected something fearful from it. Many of the Athenian youth seemed to be missing and were said to have gone to visit friends in faraway parts of Greece. At last, Theseus decided to ask his father what troubled the land. I'm afraid you've come home at an unhappy time, Aegeus sighed. There is a curse upon Athens, a curse so terrible and strange that not even you, Prince Theseus, can deal with it. Tell me all, said Theseus, for though I am but one man, yet the ever-living gods protect me and help me. The trouble is an old one, Aegeus said. It dates to a time when young men came to Athens from all over Greece and other lands to take part in contests of running, boxing, wrestling, and foot races. Kind of like the beginning of the Olympics where it started. The son of the great Minos, king of Crete, was among the contestants, and he died while he was here. His death is still a puzzle to me. Some say it was an accident. Others say he was murdered by jealous rivals. At any rate, his comrades fled in the night, bearing the news to Crete. The sea was black with King Minos' ships when he arrived seeking vengeance. His army was far too powerful for us. We went humbly out of the city to meet him and ask for mercy. This is the mercy I will show you, he said. I will not burn your city. I will not take your treasures and I will not make your people my captives. But every seven years, you must pay me a tribute. You must swear to choose by lot seven youths and seven maidens and send them to me. We had no choice but to agree. Every seven years, a ship with black sails arrives from Crete and bears away the captives. This is the seventh year and the coming of the ship is at hand. And what happens to them once they reach Crete? Theseus asked. We do not know because they never return. But the sailors of Minos say he places them in a strange prison, a kind of maze called a labyrinth. It is full of dark winding ways cut in the solid rock and therein lives a horrible monster 
called the Minotaur. This monster has the body of a man, but his head is the head of a bull, and his teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he devours everyone he meets. That, I fear, is the fate of our Athenian youth. We could burn the black-sailed ship when it arrives and slay its sailors, Theseus said. Yes, we could, answered Aegeus. But then Minos would return with his fleet and his army and destroy all of Athens. Then let me go as one of the captains, said Theseus, rising to his feet, and I will slay the Minotaur. I am your son and heir, and it is only right that I try to free Athens of this awful curse. Aegeus tried to persuade his son that such a plan was useless, but Theseus was determined, and when the ship with black sails touched the shore, he joined the doomed group. His father came to tell him goodbye for the last time, weeping bitterly. If you do manage to come back alive, he said to Theseus, lower the black sails as you approach and hoist white sails in their place so that I may know you did not die in the labyrinth. Do not worry, Theseus told him. Look for white sails. I will return in triumph. As he spoke, the dark ship put to sea and soon sailed past the horizon. After many days sailing, the ship reached Crete. The Athenian prisoners were marched to the palace where King Minos sat on his gilded throne, surrounded by his chiefs and princes, all gloriously clothed in silken robes and jewels of gold. Minos, a dark-faced man with touches of white in his hair and a long beard, sat with his elbow on his knee and his chin in his hand, and he fixed his eyes on the eyes of Theseus. Hmm. Theseus bowed, then stood erect with his eyes on the eyes of Minos. You are 15 in number, Minos said at last and my law claims only 14. I came of my own will, answered Theseus. Why? asked Minos. The people of Athens have a mind to be free, O king. There is a way, said Minos. Slay the Minotaur, and you are free of my tribute. I am minded to slay him, said Theseus. And as he spoke, there was a stir in the throng of chiefs and princes, and a beautiful young woman glided through and stood a little behind the throne. This is Ariadne, the daughter of Minos, a wise and tender-hearted maiden. Theseus bowed low and again stood erect with his eyes on the face of Ariadne. You speak like a king's son, Minos said with a smile, perhaps one who has never known hardship. I have known hardship, and my name is Theseus, Aegeus's son. I have come to ask you to let me face the Minotaur alone. If I cannot slay it, my companions will follow me into the labyrinth. Hmm, I see, said Minos. Very well. The king's son wishes to die alone. Let him do so. The Athenians were led upstairs in the long galleries, each to a chamber more rich and beautiful than they had ever seen in their dreams. Each was taken to a bath and washed and clothed in new garments and then treated to a lavish feast. None had the appetite to eat, though, except Theseus. He knew he would need his strength. That night, as he was preparing for bed, Theseus heard a soft knock at his door. And suddenly Ariadne, the king's daughter, was standing in his room. Once again, Theseus gazed into her eyes and saw there was a kind of strength and compassion he had never known before. Too many of your countrymen have disappeared into my father's labyrinth, she said quietly. I have brought you a dagger and I can show you and your friends the way to flee. I thank you for the dagger, Theseus answered, but I cannot flee. If you wish to show me a way, Show me the way to the Minotaur. 
Even if you are strong enough to kill the monster, Ariadne whispered, you will need to find your way out of the labyrinth. It is made of so many dark twists and turns, so many dead ends and false passages, that not even my father knows the secrets of its windings. If you are determined to go forward with your plan, you must take this with you. She took from her gown a spool of gold thread and pressed it into Theseus's hand. As soon as you get inside the labyrinth, she said, tie the end of the thread to a stone and hold tight to the spool as you wander through the maze. When you are ready to come back, the thread will be your guide. Theseus gazed at her, hardly knowing what to say. Why are you doing this? He finally asked. If your father finds out, you'll be in great danger. Yes, Ariadne answered slowly. But if I had not acted, you and your friends would be in far greater danger. And Theseus knew then that he loved her. The next morning, Theseus was led to the labyrinth. As soon as the guard shut him inside, he fastened one end of the thread to a pointed rock and began to walk slowly, keeping firm hold of the precious string. He made his way down the broadest corridor, from which others turned off to the right and left, until he came to a wall. He retraced his steps and tried another hallway, and then another always stopping every few feet to listen for the monster. He passed through many dark, winding passages, sometimes coming to places he had already been before, but gradually descending further and further into the labyrinth. Finally, he reached a room heaped high with bones, and he knew now he was very near the beast. He sat still, and from far away, he heard a faint sound like the echo of a roar. He stood up and listened keenly. The sound came nearer and louder, not deep like the roar of a bull, but more shrill and thin. Theseus stooped quickly and scooped up a handful of dirt from the floor of the labyrinth. And with his other hand, he drew his dagger. The roars of the minotaur came nearer and nearer. Now his feet could be heard thudding along the echoing floor. There was a heavy rustling, then sniffing, then silence. Theseus moved to the shadowy corner of the narrow path and crouched there. His heart was beating quickly. On came the minotaur. It caught sight of the crouching figure, gave a great roar and rushed straight for it. Theseus leaped up and dodging to one side, dashed his handful of dirt into the beast's eyes. The minotaur bellowed in pain. It rubbed its eyes with its monstrous hands, shrieking and confused. It tossed its great head up and down, and it turned round and round, feeling with its hands for the wall. It was quite blind. Theseus drew his dagger, crept up behind the monster, and quickly slashed at its leg. Down fell the minotaur with a crash and a roar, biting at the rocky floor with its lion's teeth, waving its hands and clawing at the empty air. Theseus waited for his chance when the clutching hands rested, and then three times he drove the sharp blade through the heart of the minotaur. The body leaped and then lay still. Theseus kneeled and thanked all the gods. And when he had finished his prayer, he took his dagger and hacked off the head of the minotaur. With the head in his hand, he began following the string out of the labyrinth. It seemed he would never come to the end of those dark, gloomy passages. Had the thread snapped somewhere? And had he, after all, lost his way? But still, he followed it anxiously until at last he came to the entrance and he sank to the ground, worn out with his struggle and his wanderings. I don't know what miracle caused you to come out of the labyrinth alive, Minos said when he saw the monster's head. 
but I will keep my word. I promised you freedom if you slew the Minotaur. You and your comrades may go. Now let there be peace between your people and mine. Farewell. Theseus knew he owed his life and his country's freedom, freedom to Ariadne's courage, and he knew he could not leave without her. Some say he asked Minos for her hand in marriage and that the king gladly consented. Others say she stole onto the departing ship at the last minute without her father's knowledge. Either way, the two lovers were together when the anchor lifted and the dark ship sailed away from Crete. But this happy ending is mixed with tragedy, as stories sometimes are. For the Cretan captain of the vessel did not know he was to hoist white sail if Theseus came home in triumph. And King Aegeus, as he anxiously watched the waters from a high cliff, spied the black sails coming over the horizon. His heart broke at once, and he fell from the towering cliff into the sea, which is now called the Aegean Sea. So that is a Greek mythology story about the Minotaur, but it demonstrates the value of courage. And really, courage is just doing what's right, even when we're afraid. That is true courage. And I hope that we can each have courage in our activities and the things that we do, because that is an important thing to develop. Remember, grandma loves you. Bye.